straight on as time is tight in this debate as well. The next item of business is the debate on motion 5290 in the name of Annabelle Ewing on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill at stage one. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Annabelle Ewing, Minister, to speak to move the motion. 13 minutes, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am very pleased to be here today to open the debate on the general principles of the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. I would like to thank all of those who gave evidence and the convener and members of the Justice Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the bill at stage one. In particular, I would like to thank the survivors who have been brave enough to come forward and to share their experiences. Many survivors have campaigned for this change in the law for many years, and I would like to thank them for their bravery and their persistence. Without them, we would not be here today. I welcome the Justice Committee's support for the general principles of the bill, I am pleased to see that they recognise the importance of widening access to justice and removing a barrier which has proved insurmountable for so many survivors. The committee has highlighted some key issues and I will seek to address these in today's debate. As some members will be aware, this bill is put forward in response to a recommendation by the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Through their work in the interaction process, which is a facilitated negotiation within a human rights framework, and their subsequent action plan on justice for victims of historic abuse of children in care, the Commission clearly brought to light the difficulties survivors currently face in trying to access the civil justice system. Their work and evidence from a range of other sources demonstrates that the three-year limitation period is a barrier that most survivors have found impossible to overcome. That is why I am here today this bill is about access to justice. It is about acknowledging the unique position of survivors of childhood abuse, recognizing the abhorrent nature of the abuse, the vulnerability of the child at the time, and the profound impact of abuse, an impact which lasts well into adulthood. This bill removes the three-year limitation period for cases of childhood abuse. It does so for rights of action arising before or after the bill comes into force. Moreover, the bill allows cases that have been previously uh, raised but which were unsuccessful precisely because of the limitation period to be re-litigated. This bill is a significant step for survivors of childhood abuse, recognizing their unique position and the barriers they have faced in the past. As I have been keen to point out, presiding officer, this bill is about striking a balance. At every step in the process, of developing the policy and drafting the bill, important judgments have had to be made as to where the balance should be struck. This has included careful consideration of the implications of the European Convention on Human Rights. It has also included striking a balance between being inclusive and at the same time avoiding unintended consequences. On the definition of abuse, I have listened carefully to the evidence presented to the committee and I have noted their recommendations. I would say that the bill uh, goes further than other jurisdictions by including sexual, physical and emotional abuse. While similar legislation elsewhere has been limited to only sexual abuse or has included emotional abuse, which is connected to other forms of abuse. I have noted the committee's concern about the uncertainty around emotional abuse. While it may be more challenging to define and prove emotional abuse, this does not make the impact of such abuse any less fundamental or its consequences any less severe. What we are concerned with is abuse that seriously damages a child's emotional health and development. It will ultimately be for the court to decide whether a case presented to them involves emotional abuse and providing any further definition on the face of the bill may prove to be misleading or exclusionary. I agree with the Scottish Human Rights Commission that Scottish courts are well placed to make assessments on a case-by-case -case basis about whether a case meets the relevant threshold to constitute abuse. I have also considered the evidence which has been put to the committee about the different forms that abuse can take and how that might influence the bill's definition of abuse. I am keen to ensure that the bill is confined to truly abusive behaviour, avoiding unintended consequences such as satellite litigation, testing and pushing its boundaries. It is also important to point out that for forms of abuse not mentioned on the bill, the definition is inclusive rather than exhaustive, 
and the court is well placed to make appropriate judgments based on the evidence. I have, however, reflected on the evidence to the committee and its recommendation in relation to abuse that takes the form of neglect. And I will, presiding officer, be giving this issue further careful consideration. Turning to section C of the bill, the new section 17C uh, uh, provides that cases that have previously been raised but which were unsuccessful because of time bar can be relitigated, regardless of whether they were determined by the court or settled between uh, the parties without damages being paid, including where there is a decree of absolvator. I recognise that this is a unique step, but it is being taken because the position of childhood abuse survivors is unique. The context of childhood abuse, the particular impact that childhood abuse has on survivors, and the fact that limitation periods have in the past operated so as to frustrate access to justice for survivors provides the necessary special justification. If decrees of absolvator were not included in the bill, a large number of survivors who previously raised cases, often cases that were assisted behind a lead case awaiting the outcome of that lead case, would not benefit from the bill. Those survivors agreed to the disposal of their cases because of the limitation of the limitation period, and it would be fundamentally unfair to treat them differently from a case that happened to be the lead case and which was therefore disposed of by the court by decree of dismissal on the basis of those same limitation grounds. Liam MacArthur. I'm grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I, I very much understand the rationale uh, for including decrees of absolvator uh, within the, the scope of the bill. Um, what I'm perhaps struggling to understand is how this wouldn't necessarily set a precedent uh, that could be potentially dangerous in, in other areas uh, of the law. Minister. I thank the member for his intervention. What I have tried to stress at the outset today and indeed in committee is that uh, the drafting of the bill uh, was conducted further to a very careful consideration of striking the right balance to reflect the unique set of circumstances pertaining to survivors of childhood abuse and to respect, of course, uh, laws that are otherwise applicable, including, of course, the, the Convention. And I have to say that having conducted this careful consideration, I do not uh, uh, share the, 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 the concerns expressed by the member that there could be any wider application. Uh, the the uh, the way in which the bill has been drafted clearly sets forth the special justification uh, requirement uh, that you need to adduce in order to displace certain uh, elements that would otherwise be applicable. And having carefully considered the matter, I can uh, give the member assurance that I am satisfied that the provisions of the bill are convention uh, compatible. I have listened with interest to the evidence presented to the committee in relation to previously raised cases. The committee has noted concerns about the provisions of the bill which prevent actions from being re-raised where there was a financial award which went beyond simply reimbursement of expenses. These provisions are based on the policy that only actions that previously failed on time bar should be allowed to be re-raised and thus reflecting the balance that I was explaining to Mr. MacArthur a moment ago. If a survivor received financial compensation from the previous action, the link to failure due to time bar is not there. As I said, this bill is about striking this balance and this is one of those issues where special care has to be taken. This bill already goes further than other jurisdictions which have implemented similar legislation. These other jurisdictions either do not allow relitigation at all or restrict relitigation to cases determined by the court. I noted earlier the committee's concern about including the decree of absolvator and whether this would be convention uh, compatible. But can I say that the suggestion mooted by the committee on this particular issue uh, in terms of uh, the, the position where there has been some financial compensation, I would say that any compensation previously paid uh, against any new compensation that would be awarded takes these ECHR concerns, I believe, to a whole new level and would significantly tip the balance away from the special justification and proportionality that is required in relation to potential interference with the ECHR in particular to Article 1 of Protocol 1. I have also noted concerns with regard to potential difficulties in establishing the terms of the settlement. As I said in my evidence to the committee, a pursuer seeking to rely on Section 17C would have the burden of proving that the circumstances of their case fell within its terms unless that fact was admitted by the defender. Proving that the case is covered by Section 17C will involve the pursuer leading evidence to this effect, which could involve a statement of their own understanding of what previously took place. It could also include records that the court holds, or the pursuer could call on the defender to disclose 
any formal documentation to which the defender had access. I will reflect on what, if anything, can be clarified in the explanatory uh, notes, presiding officer. As regards section 17D, the committee has also noted some concerns with regard to this provision. This section ensures that actions to which the bill applies will only be able to proceed if the defender's convention rights would not be breached as a consequence, whilst it is clear that even without this section, such actions would not be able to proceed. This section ensures that there is a mechanism for these issues to be dealt with and it sets out the test that the court is to apply. These provisions make it clear that as a legis legislature, we do not expect every single case to proceed just because it falls within the new section 17A. And we recognise that there will be cases where issues of fairness and prejudice will have to be carefully assessed. This is important, especially in the context of the unusual steps we are taking in this bill. Without Section 17D, it may appear as if the legislature assumed that all cases should go ahead regardless of ECHR concerns. Removing this section, presiding officer, could therefore result in a challenge to the bill which would have an impact on all potential cases with the result that survivors would be deprived of the benefit of the bill whilst that challenge was resolved. Section 17D is another difficult area that has required careful, careful reflection of where the balance should be struck. Whilst I can sympathise with calls for more clarity, this is after all a very difficult uh, area and complex area of the law, it is important to keep in mind that each case has to be considered on its own facts and circumstances. Uh, it is clear that what is relevant in one case could be completely irrelevant in another. And whilst it is impossible to predict what will be important in each case, factors that the courts might consider to cause prejudice to the defender include the diminution of the quality and availability of evidence or the defender's affairs or resources having been arranged in reliance on the disposal of an earlier case. However, it must remain a task of the court to assess whether or not these or other factors would give rise to the defender being substantially prejudiced in all the circumstances of the case and whether, having had regard to the pursuer's interest, the prejudice is such that the action cannot proceed. I am, however, keen to avoid a checklist approach to these very complex issues. My concern is that more guidance in the legislation, such as a list of factors, could perhaps unhelpfully constrain the court's considerations. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Justice Committee once again for its detailed scrutiny of the bill and for its support of the general principles. This bill is about access to justice. It is about recognising the unique position of survivors of childhood uh, abuse and the barriers that they currently uh, face. This unique position means that the current limitation regime acts as an impossible barrier for most survivors. It requires the survivors to explain to the court why they have not raised an action earlier, a task which has proved extremely challenging and traumatic for many survivors. It is clear that the current limitation regime has created an inbuilt resistance to allowing historical claims to proceed. This bill recognises that this inbuilt resistance is not appropriate for cases of childhood abuse. This is because by the very nature of these cases, it is likely to take years, often decades, before a survivor is in a position to come forward. Meeting survivors, I have been struck by their dedication, their bravery and their determination to keep fighting for the acknowledgement and recognition they deserve and for justice. And I hope you will all join me today supporting the general principles of this bill, which gives them that recognition. I move, uh, presiding officer, that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I call on Margaret Mitchell, please, to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to speak in this Stage 1 debate on the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill and on behalf of the Justice Committee to thank the various witnesses who took the time to provide evidence to the Committee. My grateful thanks also to the clerks and the Committee members for their hard work in producing this report. In particular, I pay tribute to those survivors of childhood abuse who were willing to share their views with the committee, either in private or during our formal evidence sessions. Their contributions have been invaluable in shaping our thinking on the bill, and we fully recognise the immense courage it took to appear before the committee. Childhood abuse, in whichever form it takes, is abhorrent. The committee heard that being the subject of childhood abuse can have a silencing effect, shame, guilt and fear, as well as the stigma associated with abuse, can prevent survivors from disclosing this abuse until many years after the event. Because abusers are often figures of authority, survivors are also frequently left with feelings of fear or mistrust 
towards authorities. This in turn means that it may be a considerable number of years, if at all, before survivors feel able to disclose or take action. Despite this, the current civil law fails to recognise why there can be delays in reporting and survivors are expected to make a claim by their 19th birthday. The courts have typically not accepted explanations for delay resulting from shame, fear and psychological difficulties that can result from childhood abuse. So whilst the current law provides judges with the discretion to allow a case, a case to proceed, even if it is brought out with the three-year limitation period, this discretion has virtually never been used. In over 40 years, there has been just one reported case relating to historical childhood abuse, which has been allowed to proceed. In view of this, the committee considers that survivors have been let down by the justice system and have been denied the opportunity to have their voice heard. The bill therefore removes the limitation period, also known as time bar, for civil claims relating to childhood abuse. The committee heard, heard powerful evidence that the time bar has created an insurmountable barrier to access to justice in the civil courts. Survivors of such abuse should be able to bring a civil claim for damages if they wish to do so. The committee is therefore unanimous in its support for this bill, which gives survivors a voice and, crucially, which removes a barrier to accessing justice. Furthermore, given the nature of childhood abuse, the committee considers the retrospective effect to be both necessary and justified. However, pursuing a civil action will not be the right solution for all survivors, and in this respect, it is not a panacea. In fact, the committee heard that the court process could sometimes do more harm than good. But it is extremely important to recognise, as one survivor told the committee, the significance of the bill is that, at long last, survivors will have the choice. Having said that, support must be available to survivors to take that choice. The committee therefore wholeheartedly agrees with the Minister that without such support, the bill will be an empty gesture. And if a survivor does not decide to pursue civil action, there are other options to them, including the Scottish Childhood Abuse Inquiry or the Apologies Scotland Act. Turning now to other provisions, the bill does not remove the time bar for survivors who were abused before 1964. This is because their substantive right to claim compensation will have been extinguished entirely by the law of prescription. To revive these rights in the bill would involve imposing legal liability anew where none had existed for over 30 years. The committee is persuaded by the Scottish Government's argument that this approach would raise serious human rights implications. But it urges the Government to consider what other options for redress could be made available for pre-1964 cases. The Bill defines abuse as including physical, sexual and emotional abuse. Overall, the committee agreed with this definition. However, members heard strong support particularly from the Scottish Human Rights Commission for explicitly including neglect within the definition of the bill. The committee considered this would be consistent with other domestic and international law. This includes the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Scottish Government's own national guidance for child protection in Scotland, which clearly documents that abuse and neglect are forms of maltreatment. More complex provisions in the, blue, in the bill include Section 17C, which allows certain previously raised cases to be re-raised, including those disposed of by a decree, a, a de decree absolvator. This in turn has proportionality and human rights implications, in particular in relation to a person's right to a fair trial and the right to peaceful enjoyment of their possessions. A decree absolvator is a final judgment of the court in favour of the defender and usually prevents the same issue being litigated again. 
The committee understands that there is no precedent for legislating away decrees of absolvator as provided for in the bill and that section 17c therefore raises issues about legal certainty. Furthermore, it was the view of some witnesses that this approach undermines fundamental principles of Scots law and could breach convention rights. Section 17d provides safeguards for defenders. The committee's report raises a number of concerns about these provisions, which I hope other members will refer to in more detail. Suffice to say, the Minister told the committee that this bill is all about striking balances, and the committee recognises that to be the case. And notwithstanding the Minister's opening comments, it has therefore asked the Government to look again at this provision to ensure the right balance is struck. Finally, a vitally important issue raised during the committee's scrutiny of the bill was its financial and resource implications. The committee heard these could result in significant costs for bodies such as local authorities and charities. The financial memorandum does not attempt to quantify these costs. While the committee recognises the difficulties in doing so, it considers that the financial memorandum does not fully reflect the fact that these costs go beyond any compensation to be paid. It may, for example, include a significant administrative burden in responding to information requests from people considering making a claim. Given this, the committee's report highlights the potential negative impact that the financial and resource implications of the bill could have on the provision of current services. This includes the adverse effect the bill's provision could have on support services. In the words of one witness, it would be illogical that vital support provided to children today who have been abused or are at risk of being abused should be adversely affected by the bill. And the committee therefore called on the government to ensure that the bill is properly resourced. In conclusion, presiding officer, the committee supports the removal of the limitation period for childhood abuse claims and fully endorses the general principles of the bill. Thank you, convener. I now call on Douglas Ross to open for Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Mr Ross. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scottish Conservatives support this bill and its aims. Like the convener, I would like to put on record my thanks as a member of the Justice Committee to the Clarks and Spice for their work during our Stage 1 considerations. I'd also like to acknowledge the sensitive and constructive way Margaret Mitchell chaired our meetings and evidence sessions which looked at such an emotive and personal issue. Above all, and like the Minister and the Convener, I would like to pay tribute to everyone who gave evidence and responded to the Committee's call for evidence. The bravery shown by the witnesses who had themselves been victims of childhood abuse highlighted their resolve that a change in the law is required. As a committee, we heard powerful evidence that the current limitation regime has created a significant barrier to justice for survivors of childhood abuse. While Section 19A of the Prescription and Limitation Act 1973 allows courts to ignore the time bar when it seems equitable to do so, the fact that courts have used this discretion only once since the Act was passed more than four decades ago means a change is needed. We know that victims often don't come forward with compensation claims until many years or indeed many decades after their abuse. It is wrong that the limitation period should prevent victims seeking this course of redress. Tonight, Parliament, with the approval of this Stage 1 report, can start the process of correcting that wrong. And while there is support for this legislation, the unanimously agreed committee report also noted concerns that I hope the Government will continue to monitor and address. I've read the Minister's response to the committee report and have concerns that legitimate issues which we have raised by all committee members have only received so far a superficial response from the Government. An example of this is the Scottish Government's financial memorandum, which is based on a figure of 2,200 cases that could be brought forward initially following the passage of this legislation. The Government's response to our report maintains this position. Despite several witnesses questioning this figure and the committee noting at paragraph 222 that the 2200 figure could be a significant underestimate. 
Police Scotland argued that there is value in further scoping the methodology used in the financial memorandum and considered the 2,200 figure a conservative estimate. And Harry Aitken of the former Boys and Girls Abused Organisation highlighted to the committee that one firm of solicitors previously had a thousand survivors prepared to raise an action, but they'd not been able to proceed following a test case relating to the time bar. It is paramount that survivors who have been previously unable to raise a civil action due to the time bar are not then left frustrated and disappointed with this legislation because the Scottish Government has not adequately projected the number of cases that could be brought forward and the Government must put in place the necessary resources to support this increase of possible actions. And still on finance, I would like to put on record my own concern about the scrutiny by the Finance Committee of this Parliament into the Bill. I note the convener is in the Chamber uh, and I would just highlight that at paragraph 37 of our report, the Committee notes that the Finance and Constitution Committee received responses to its call for evidence on the financial memorandum, but then agreed that it would give no further consideration to the financial memorandum. My understanding is that that has not been the practice in the past and I would be keen to understand why the Finance Committee took this approach when it, many others have raised issues about the financial implications of the Bill. Another concern that was shared by some witnesses was the capacity of the court system. For people who have waited for many years to take this action, it will be important that they are not discouraged by lengthy and potentially avoidable delays. On page 10 of the Minister's response to the committee report, Annabel Ewing said on this issue that she expected that the actions raised as a result of this bill will be spread over a number of years. Yet I would suggest there's a compelling argument to say that many people who have waited several decades for a genuine opportunity to raise an action will want to do it very soon after the bill becomes law. And I think this issue must be fully considered by the Scottish Government. The final issue I want to raise is the recommendation at paragraph 245 and just alluded to by the convener. This recommendation was agreed by all members of all parties and it says it is important that the bill is properly resourced to ensure both that its policy intent is achieved and to prevent any negative impact on the provision of current services by local authorities. That recommendation is far stronger than the response I got from the Minister at Committee when I asked if the Scottish Government was addressing the issues COSLA had raised about resourcing investigations and of the claims and also potential financial awards. The Minister responded to my question by saying the Government were in consultation with COSLA and that we have to see what happens. What the committee says must happen is the government resource this bill and local authorities must not have to cut services to pay for historical offences. We need the Scottish Government to accept this recommendation and tell us how they will achieve it. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, as the Justice Committee report states, this bill is no panacea. It will not be a solution to everyone who is looking for a solution to their childhood abuse. But there can be no doubting from the witnesses Witnesses I personally felt privileged to listen to that this bill is an important step forward for many as an access for justice. It is our duty as a parliament to ensure that the bill meets the aspirations of the people who have suffered from childhood abuse. Having waited so long for this opportunity, it is incumbent on each and every one of us to give victims the best legislation to ensure that we really do give survivors a voice that they have been denied for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Ross. I call on Claire Baker at Home for Labour. Um, seven minutes, please, Ms. Speaker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. This is a narrowly defined bill, but it is an important bill. The issue it's looking to address is one that has been recognised as an injustice for a number of years. Child abuse, sexual, physical and emotional, has a lasting and damaging impact on a person's life. And we are aware of the risks and vulnerabilities they have to face in creating safe, secure and happy lives for themselves. Access to the civil justice system was one part of that process that some survivors will want to access and this bill intends to make that possible. The report does recognise that while it is not a panacea and it will not be the right path for everyone, it will provide choice. I was struck by the committee's thanks to survivors who presented evidence to the committee, recognising their courage and sharing their experience. We should all recognise that this legislation is being introduced to provide options for people who have suffered very traumatic, damaging childhoods and adolescence. And while it is limited in what it can achieve and that it provides a date beyond which claims cannot proceed, and while it does not extend 
just, sorry, and while it does extend access to justice, it's not a path that all survivors may wish to take. The bill does increase options for people to have their voice heard and acknowledged. There has been evidence to question the necessity of the bill, highlighting the existence of the section 19A, which gives the court discretion to waive the time limit. There has been debate over undermining legal certainty, about creating an exemption that would then set a precedence, and the quality of evidence that could be compromised by the passage of time. But this discretion has only been exercised once by the courts. Witnesses describe the barriers faced by survivors looking to take civil action, the time bar not recognising the complexity of the nature of the abuse, which creates barriers to raising a claim, and the inconsistency with being able to pursue a criminal case for child abuse. The evidence from Victim Support Scotland outlines some of the difficulties faced by survivors. They said it can take years for someone to realise what has happened to them was in fact abuse, and it is common for abusers to use silence and tactics to ensure that the abuse is kept hidden. A significant amount of time can also be required for a person to feel able to disclose their abuse. Because abusers are often figures of authority in the victim's lives, they are regularly left with feelings of fear or mistrust towards authorities, which can present challenges in reporting the abuse or participating in court action. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers gave evidence arguing that anyone who's looked at this matter over the years would be forced to conclude that the Scottish judiciary is an extremely conservative body and that it has operated the discretionary power in a way that has simply closed the door. And while this bill is welcome, it is regrettable that it has perhaps taken longer than was necessary to bring it forward. The difficulty with the time bar is well documented. In 2008, 10 years ago, Lord McEwen said in a judgment, I have an uneasy feeling that the legislation and the strict way the courts have interpreted it has failed a generation of children who have been abused and whose attempts to seek a legal remedy has become mired in the legal system. The concerns I express remain with me, although sitting in the outer house, there is little I can do about it, except to hope that reform will not be long delayed. Now, I do welcome the government bringing forward the bill in this session, but I cannot help but consider the survivors who have continued to be excluded from civil action when they could have been given an earlier remedy. The bill has been introduced in the shadow of the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry, an inquiry which is hugely challenging, but has also been problematic and has struggled to maintain the confidence of all survivor groups. While this bill addresses one aspect of the legacy of this abuse and goes further than the scope of the inquiry, it is imperative that the inquiry delivers accountability, answers and transparency. While I, along with the committee, support the broad principles of the bill, there are a number of areas requiring further clarification or debate. In recognising the bill provides choice for survivors, there is also recognition that this is a difficult task, with all the normal practices of the legal system. The Minister might want to say more about what kind of support could be made available to survivors bringing civil actions and what kind of training or specialisation there could be with the legal profession. There was also a discussion of the merits of specialist courts, which the government could legislate for if they accepted the case. There is a further debate to be had about the definition of abuse within the bill. While I wasn't convinced by the arguments opposing a non-exhaustive definition, there were persuasive arguments about expanding the categories for abuse to have consistency with ECHR and international human rights law. And I welcome the Minister's comments in this respect this afternoon. Witnesses also raised questions about spiritual abuse and psychological abuse, which the Minister considered and thought would be covered by emotional abuse, but a bit more certainty here might be helpful. There are two final issues that I wish to raise, a financial redress scheme and the accuracy of the financial memorandum. COSLA, Social Work Scotland and SOLAR argue the merits of a financial redress scheme. The bill will not apply to people abused prior to 1964 and there is no civil action available to them. I understand that a financial redress scheme could be a way to recognise their experience. It is also argued that it could avoid the stress and the exposure that would come with a public declaration needed through a civil case. It could also recognise the age and the health of some of the complainers and ensure that they are provided with redress while they can access it. It has been described as a way to possibly complement the bill rather than an alternative and I would urge the government to advance the work on this as soon as possible. The committee raised concerns about the financial impact of the bill and the potential number of actions that could be brought forward, believing the estimate to be conservative. 
and they had heard the concerns of potentially significant costs to defenders from COSLA and others. These are important matters that the government must resolve. I imagine there will be greater integration of the bill at stage two regarding the retrospective application, the fair hearing test and the substantial prejudice test. It is important we get this legislation right and it delivers the policy objective that it is aiming to, one that we all support. The government will have our support in taking forward this legislation. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. Moving to the open debate, speeches of six minutes, please. Rona Mackay to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Ms. Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, access to justice is fundamental to a civilised democratic society, and the Scottish justice system has a track record to be proud of. That's why the Stage 1 Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill being brought before Parliament today is so important and so very necessary. It provides the vehicle for access to justice to thousands of, thousands of the most vulnerable and wrong people in our society who have been barred from justice simply because they were unable to bring forward a civil action within a three-year period. <laughs> Presiding officer, three years is not long enough for survivors to garner the strength to proceed with civil action against their abusers. They've been emotionally terrorised, stricken with fear and guilt, and simply need longer, much longer, to come to terms with what has happened to them. In a study of sexual abuse allegations by 180 survivors against Anglican clergy in Australia, the average time from the alleged sexual abuse to making a complaint was 25 years for males and 18 years for females. Because this is not a court action about neighbours fighting over a piece of land or suing a company for damages, this is about seeking recognition and an apology for being robbed of a childhood and sentenced to a lifetime of unimaginable emotional distress. During the evidence-taking process of this bill, members of the Justice Committee heard shocking, painful and distressing accounts of the terrible abuse survivors had suffered during childhood, sexual, physical and mental abuse. But if it was painful for us to hear, it must have been agonising for the survivors to recount, and I cannot thank and commend those who had the bravery and courage to do so highly enough. From somewhere deep within them, they found the strength to speak out about their traumatic experiences, the cruelty bestowed upon them, often by people they trusted, and how they were left feeling worthless and violated. They spoke out so that never again would these vile crimes be covered up. They did it to send a message to abusers that they will be caught and justice will be done so that future generations do not have to endure a lifetime of suffering like them. They did it to ensure that there is no hiding place for abusers. Presiding officer, there have been fears that this bill will open the floodgates to those seeking compensation, which will be costly and put extra pressure on the court system, an issue raised by Douglas Ross and others. Of course, at this stage, the numbers seeking access to justice for historical crimes is unknown, and estimates vary widely. There simply is no way of predicting at this stage. However, the Scottish Human Rights Committee believe the vast majority of survivors will not go down the civil court justice route. But what is certain is that this recourse will not be suitable or desirable for everybody. Many survivors simply could not face the prospect of publicly resurrecting the horrors that they kept locked away in a box throughout their lives. Bringing it to court is not the answer for them. For those that do bring it to court, clearly expectations must be managed, particularly for claims that may be historic or partial, and the support must be there for claimants, that, that's clear. There may be potential for specialist judges or courts, something that was discussed during committee, and this decision is ultimately for the Lord President to decide. The committee also carefully considered the definition of abuse and decided that it is essentially non-exhaustive and inclusive as survivors have su suffered such a wide range of different forms of abuse. Presiding officer, we all also found a common thread through most of the testimonies, and that is that most survivors would not do this for the money. Many simply want the perpetrators brought to justice and an apology for the terrible injustice and violation they suffered, which has blighted their lives, and it's only now they feel strong enough to seek justice. Many survivors have been so emotionally damaged that they've been unable to forge successful careers and attain a good standard of living. Their financial potential has not been realised and they have struggled to make ends meet. But how can you put a price on what they have suffered? You simply cannot, and that is the reason that most survivors, for most survivors, it is not about money. It's about long-awaited justice. 
In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I'd like to say that of all the speeches I've written for debates in this chamber over the past year, this has been the hardest to write. For this is about something so sensitive, so personal to those affected, that as someone who has never endured this suffering, I hardly feel qualified to comment on it. But if this bill brings some light at the end of a long, dark tunnel for some survivors, then I'm happy to commend the general principles of the bill to the Parliament. Thank you. Uh, can I say to everyone that time is a bit tight, so I would appreciate everybody uh, doing as Ms Mackay did and uh, sticking to below time if possible. And I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I, at the start, welcome this bill, welcome this debate, and welcome the work that the committee has done uh, in getting the bill to this stage. As someone who's not a member of that committee, um, I have to say it's been fairly harrowing reading, reading through the reports. And I, as someone that didn't have to listen to it directly, want to pay credit to those that came in and were brave enough to give the evidence that was required and also to the committee for dealing with it in such a sensitive way. As we're aware, this bill creates a special regime for childhood abuse cases in relation to the time period associated with personal injury actions, removing the three-year time limit that exists for certain types of claims. The practical consequences are immense. Survivors of child abuse will no longer have the difficult job, in fact, almost impossible job, of persuading the court to overrule the limitation period. They will have a right to raise an action regardless within a defined time that uh, has elapsed. As we've heard already from some of my colleagues, we as a party agree that cases of childhood abuse have unique characteristics which justify a special limitation regime. These characteristics derive from the horrible nature of the act, the particular vulnerability of the victim, and the effect that goes on through our lifetime because of the abuse. Abuse at a time when a person is vulnerable, perhaps in a dependent relationship, has been shown to have long-standing, severe, adverse consequences. Mental health, incapacity, addiction, post-traumatic stress, self-harm and behaviour often go hand in hand. Those supporting the removal of a limitation period in the evidence emphasised the impact of childhood abuse on survivors and the length of time it could take for a survivor to be able to bring a civil action. It is common for adult survivors to suppress the abuse because of shame, guilt, fear, stigma, the so-called silencing effect. Furthermore, some survivors do not know or understand that in fact they were subject to abuse until many years later. It is widely recognised that child abuse often causes victims to withhold telling others until well into their adult years. These were views that were echoed by many witnesses, Police Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland, and perhaps most harrowing, the private testimonies the committee heard of survivors of childhood abuse. I just want to highlight two slight concerns that I'd be interested for the government to respond to. The first was raised by the Faculty of Advocates that litigation is inherently stressful and will perhaps add extra strain on the victims, add to their suffering and anxiety if the cases do not come to proof quickly. Now, I appreciate this may be issues for the Lord President to look at, but I think it would be helpful for this Parliament sent out some message to say that these cases should be dealt with as quickly as possible over going through the appropriate um, ju uh, judicial process. As well as that, the appropriate support and advice for the victims and survivors of child use abuse must be there. Will there be extra funding for third sector organisations that provide that or for local authorities who provide that? 
we need to make sure that that is in place. The second issue I'd be interested to hear the government's view on is perhaps an unforeseen circumstance. Uh, because we are going back decades, some of the organisations that will face litigation may have been organisations that have taken over an organisation in that period of time. And if a claim is successful, could cause them real financial hardship and thus stop them doing what they are now doing in a very positive way. Uh, we've heard already from Douglas Walsh the issue in regard to local authorities, but I also have concerns that some third sector organisations, through no fault of their own, but simply because they simply have taken over another organisation, end up. And I'd be interested to know if there's any protection can be given to that. Having said that, we are supportive of this bill and its aims, and I look forward to this legislation coming forward uh, and being passed in due course. And hopefully, those who are victims of this, for some of them feeling that due process has now been done. Thank you very much. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Johan Lamont. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and like others, I uh, welcome uh, this bill having been brought forward, uh, but take no pleasure in the necessity uh, that it should uh, have to have uh, come to this uh, legislative solution to a problem. It's worth uh, making the point, and we had this from uh, some survivors whom we spoke to, uh, that, of course, first of all, not all are looking uh, for a court solution, and there are those for whom there is no resolution. Because it isn't simply about institutional abuse. Um, the, the bill covers abuse by individuals on individual children. And there are cases, obviously, uh, where the abuser simply is no longer around, they have died, and that kind of closure uh, for some survivors simply cannot be given. And I'm very grateful for one person in that uh, a position coming and telling their story, uh, very emotional for the person concerned, very emotional for those of us who heard it, simply because we cannot provide by legislation any uh, way forward uh, for that and I'm sure uh, other individuals. Uh, the courts are one way of getting uh, peace after abuse. Um, the Jersey uh, process that went further back in the calendar than 1964, but in very limited and very different circumstances, uh, did uh, have interest for the committee uh, in that it provided perhaps a quicker way of dealing with some things and a way that was less stressful. And I think uh, there is scope for looking at uh, uh, whether there are ways in which uh, we can, uh, as we move forward, mm -hmm. Uh, find ways of assisting people uh, by pre-action protocols and perhaps uh, uh, other non-court ways uh, of helping people as well. And I think we should not yet uh, discount that. Now, I do want to just raise one particular thing. Um, I made very brief reference during the, the, the committee consideration, but I thought a little bit more about it subsequently. And that is, this is, of course, the limitation of Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill that we're debating. And the introduction talks about childhood abuse. And I just think there is perhaps further scope for our thinking about what a child is. Because it is someone who has not reached the capacity of someone of more than 18 years old but it may also be reasonably held to apply to people whose calendar age is in excess of 18 year old, but they have not got the capacity of an adult. And I simply wonder uh, whether there is the opportunity to make sure that we capture people of a greater age, but a more limited capacity, who have suffered exactly uh, the same kind of abuse. Uh, 1.2 defines a child simply as someone under the age of 18. And there may be scope for looking at that again. Not something the committee has considered in detail, so I will understand if we can't uh, uh, see uh, where that goes forward. Now, the discussion that the committee had and the way the uh, bill is structured, it does make clear, of course, uh, that uh, we have to look at the circumstances of the abuse in the light of what the legal and practical 
position was at the point abuse took place. Now that is of course a difficult issue because it almost means that we're endorsing abuse that we would now castigate in law and in practice and in moral code, which we might not have done at the point the abuse post-1964 is covered by this Act. But I see no resolution as to how uh, we can properly do that. The issue, too, of a nugatory financial uh, settlement that may have been made, perhaps for one pound, although it's fair to say there seemed to be no evidence that any such settlements were of a nugatory nature. So perhaps it's only an academic issue. Uh, but I think the principal point that once you start to include where there has been a financial settlement and reopen that, there are real risks to the bill's legitimacy as a whole that I think I have ultimately, not initially, ultimately been uh, convinced is, the, is cast in the, the right way. It is, of course, a very simple bill in the sense that it covers two sides of paper, but the complexities of the legal issues that are contained within it are much more substantial than the limited number of words that are. Now, there's been a little bit of reference already uh, to the financial memorandum and to the uncertainty as to the number of people involved. I think the Minister's response to the committee has simply said there are other views, and that is correct. But all the views that can be expressed by various people are no more than that. No one actually knows. And I think we've got to step above uh, a rather pointless debate about numbers and say this is a principled matter where we wish to support people who have suffered childhood abuse. We simply have to deal with the practical effects of that when we come to them while making a proper initial provision uh, to cover what we think is a middle point estimate. But don't let's imagine that we can keep looking at this and find some magic certain answer. I'm convinced, and I think others are, that there ain't one to find. We do this as a matter of principle, not as a matter of money. Presiding officer. I call Johan Lamont to be followed by Mary Evans. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say that I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this debate and I would want to add my thanks to all of those for their role in getting to this stage, whether it's ministerial team, the committee and others um, for providing such a thorough report. I think this is an important stage in a long journey of confronting the reality of child abuse, addressing the needs of those who suffered in the past and reaffirming our wish to do all we can to eradicate child abuse, to protect young people and to secure justice for all those who have been abused in the past. And in recognising progress, we should, of course, be alive to the continuing hurt of those who remain excluded because the abuse happened before 1964. And in recognising progress, we should also salute those survivors, and indeed some of them are in the gallery today, who, despite the trauma of their own experience, have spoken up and spoken out, giving voice to the, those who were silenced in the past, demanding justice for the past and action to protect those who may be at risk right now and in the future. This is a day to reflect on the progress made and to resolve to continue in the search for justice, to bring out into the light of day a scourge of our society, too long without even the words to describe it and people silenced in their suffering. This bill does reflect progress and we should be optimistic about that and represents a change in the attitudes and understanding about the causes and consequences of child sexual abuse. We know that this is an abuse where the survivor experience was of not being heard, was of not being believed, and that was all too common. An experience compounded by the reality that justice was not be possible because of a time bar, a rule which seemed willfully designed to reinforce that message, that response that people had experienced all too often as children, that their abuse did not count, that had disregard for their experiences, and a time bar that silenced people, with, with not recognising that people were silenced, often into adulthood by a suffering that they could not talk about, and with a massive impact on their health and well-being. It does seem that we live in times where revelations of abuse seem by the day to emerge. Abuse in football, abuse in sports clubs, abuse by celebrities, abuse in youth clubs, abuse in churches. 
And of course, we currently see the progress, stumbling as it is, of the national inquiry into child abuse, revealing evidence of the absolute betrayal of young people abused by while in the care of the state, brought in to be protected and abused more. And of course, young people being abused as they were educated. There are some who say that they are shocked by what is reported about football. But the truth is that a survivor will tell you that while the individual experience reported by people of their abuse is shocking, it is not ultimately surprising. Because abuse is not defined by category or by location, but by the opportunity for abusers to abuse, to use their power against those without power. And that's why active child protection measures are of such importance wherever our young people are. And I do think it's particularly welcome that the government that has, in this bill, recognised this and provides rights for all survivors of abuse. Given this, I think we should take the opportunity to reflect on how we do tackle this abuse. Underpinning the development of the strategy on domestic abuse and more broadly violence against women ha um, was underpinned by the position of three Ps, prevention, provision and protection. And I would ask the Minister to confirm the commitment of the Scottish Government to take this approach to child abuse. It is essential that work on prevention is given a high priority, ensuring and educating our young people and adults to be vigilant, to know that it can happen and to find a way of speaking out if it does. And of course, this preventative work does need investment. It's essential too that there is effective provision for those survivors of abuse an awareness of how this trauma is experienced and can be tackled. And again, I would urge the government to resist the temptation to see support in only medical terms and to give proper recognition to those groups and organisations with a proven record in providing support shaped by the needs and wishes of survivors themselves. There are not only clinical solutions, there are solutions that have been developed over time alongside survivors and these may, must not be lost to us. And in this bill, we recognise the steps taken to protect young people from abuse in the future by giving a strong message that such abuse is a crime, that these, well, there will be criminal and civil remedies. And this is a powerful message that is unacceptable. And this bill and the concentration time of this parliament speaks powerfully to the importance of using this power to protect people, to understand that there are consequences for those who would seek to perpetrate abuse. In conclusion, I would urge the Scottish Government in particular to work with survivors, recognise the achievement and progress they have already secured, no matter how difficult that has been. I would ask them too to work with a cross-party group on adult survivors of child sexual abuse, whose work, whose campaigning work, brought the first successful survivor strategy and a focus on this important issue. Make a commitment to an effective survivor strategy with a ministerial focus on that work would be very, very welcome. And I acknowledge too that the journey continues to be a difficult one. A survivor of abuse in the film Hidden in Silence, which was screened last night in the parliament, said this, and I apologize if I paraphrase. She said, I do not see myself as a victim. If I say I am a victim, I continue to blame myself. I am a survivor who wants to move on with my life. I believe this bill, bill seeks to support survivors go on with their lives, certain that they are being heard and their right to justice confirmed. I'm grateful to the, the government for you bringing this bill forward. And I welcome the work that we've done as it continues to support the needs of survivors. Uh, could, could I ask those in the public gallery not to show um, pleasure or otherwise while they're sitting there? Thank you. <laughs> um, you got me all mixed up now. We have Mary Evans to be followed by Liam MacArthur. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Limitation Childhood Abuse Bill is a strong and necessary step towards achieving justice for the survivors of child abuse in Scotland. And that's where I would agree with Joanne Lamont's uh, point there about the language that we use around victim and survivors. Um, and this afternoon, I would like to demonstrate why the removal of the limitation period or the time bar in civil action cases relating to child abuse is such a vital and important step and what is needed in that legislation. I, well, and I'd really like to start by echoing what we've heard around the chamber this afternoon because what the current law doesn't recognise are the innumerable reasons that someone may not come forward about childhood, ab childhood abuse by the age of 19. Victim Support Scotland in their evidence to the committee outlined some of those reasons why survivors may not come forward. It takes some years to realise that experiences were actually abuse and many have not come to terms with it. Abusers use silence and tactics to keep their victims from talking about what happened. Tactics which are effective years into the future, even when that person is no longer under the direct influence of the abuser. Shame, fear of authority, the stigma associated with the events. All of these are reasons that a survivor of childhood abuse may not come forward and take civil action in the period of limitation currently set out. The limitation punishes those who have survived this trauma by effectively not allowing them the time to come to terms with what they've experienced. This was the experience that, as a committee, we heard direct evidence of when we met with a survivor of childhood abuse who shared her experience with us, and it was, it was just harrowing. She'd spent most of her early life in foster care. She had been systematically abused by her own family, by her foster family, in a children's home, and by a professional who worked with children. She carried a constant guilt with her and only started the incredibly long journey towards addressing what had happened to her years later when she sought help for depression. And it was actually a health professional who had, I, that she spoke to that identified a potential cause of the feelings that she was experiencing. Her brother, who had been in care with her, had committed suicide. And that was something that she said may not have happened had he known that this remedy was coming along. In a note to the committee, she wrote, Abuse of power is a mental trap for the victim. It can take many years, if not a lifetime, to find our true being. And that is why this bill is so vitally important. The current law allows for the court to use discretion and permit a case to proceed, even if it would normally be limited. But as we've heard, in 44 years, this discretionary ability has only been used once since the law was enacted in 1973. The government's policy memorandum on this bill noted that the method in which judges have used this discretionary ability has created an insurmountable barrier to justice for victims of childhood abuse. A number of organisations commented on this in both their written and oral evidence to the committee. The Scottish Human Rights Commission highlighted one judgment in particular where it was commented, the legislation and the strict way the courts have interpreted it has failed a generation of children who have been abused. With no cognizance of the legitimate reasons why those cases simply could not have been brought forward within the three years. There is no confidence in the use of discretion, and this has borne itself out in the cases presented since 1973. That is why this legislation is essential, so that survivors have the confidence in bringing those cases forward. One area in the proposed bill I hope the government will take into consideration from the committee's report is the definition of the word abuse, what constitutes abuse, and how broad or restrictive this definition should be. And I would like to focus specifically on the inclusion of neglect. As the proposed bill is currently written, childhood abuse covers sexual abuse, physical abuse and emotional abuse, with the neglect omitted on the grounds that it could, as outlined again in the policy memorandum, become problematic by broadening the scope of the bill beyond what was intended. The government noted that some types of neglect could equal abuse, arguing that this would fall under the label of emotional abuse. While I fully agree that we should not attempt uh, to create an exhaustive list of actions that could constitute abuse, I think neglect is a category of abuse separate from the current definition. During one of our evidence sessions, the representative for the Scottish Human Rights Commission strongly encouraged the explicit addition of neglect into the definition of abuse to bring the bill into line with international human rights standards, which clearly list neglect as a separate category. 
the inclusion of neglect in the definition would not change the substantive law regarding the proof required by the victim or pursuer to win the case, but as Cosla too noted, it could give more certainty to victims of an abusive form of neglect wishing to come forward. I would urge the Scottish Government to consider including neglect in the definition of abuse. It can manifest itself differently than a form of emotional abuse and not explicitly including it could add more doubt to victims struggling to come to terms with what they went through. Disposing of the limitations on childhood abuse civil cases is a huge step to help the generations of survivors of childhood abuse on their journey to recovery, justice, and perhaps for some, some form of closure. And I really do commend the Scottish Government for taking that step and for bringing this legislation forward. The bill has the general support of the committee, support from a number of key organisations, and most importantly, from the survivors whom it will most affect. This bill won't be able to right all the wrongs for all of those who've suffered child abuse, and it certainly won't be the answer for everyone. Um, but from here on in, it's vitally important that the survivors receive the support that they need if they're looking to take an action forward, and that the survivors of abuse which took place prior to 1964, currently inhibited by the law of prescription, are also provided with adequate paths to justice. Thank you. Uh, members are beginning to stray over the six minutes, which affects later speakers. Can you watch that, please? Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, can I start with an apology to you, to the Minister and to MSP colleagues, as I need to catch a flight uh, back to Orkney this evening and therefore won't be able to stay till the conclusion of the debate. So can I also start by confirming that Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly support and will be voting in favour of the general principles of the Limitations Bill uh, this evening. Having consistently with others made the case for such a measure, we warmly welcome uh, the government's decision to bring forward this very short uh, but crucially important piece of legislation. It does not, of course, stand in isolation, and the Scottish uh, Human Rights Commission is right to remind us of how this bill fits within a wider context of efforts to ensure survivors of historic childhood abuse have effective access to justice and effective remedies, including through the Apology Law, uh, National Inquiry and the Survivor Support Fund. Nevertheless, the Limitations Bill represents an important milestone, one which will have both practical but also symbolic uh, significance. Before touching on the detail of the bill and some of the areas where I think uh, improvements may still be needed, can I thank uh, colleagues in the committee, Clark, Spice, and of course, all those who gave evidence to our committee. This is not an easy or a comfortable subject to address, but we were fortunate in the candor and the sensitivity with which the evidence was presented. Much of it has been compelling, compelling, but without doubt, the evidence that has hit home the hardest has been that from survivors themselves. So I would like to offer special thanks, as others have done, to them for showing the strength and the courage to share with us their experience, their insights, uh, and what this bill means uh, to them. It doesn't take long uh, in the company of a survivor to understand very clearly why these changes to the law are essential. It is estimated to take, on average, 22 years for a survivor of childhood abuse to be in a position to feel able to talk openly about what they have suffered. For some, that point never arrives. This silencing effect goes to the heart of why a new approach is needed. Of course, the courts already have discretion to set aside legal limitations in such cases. In practice, though, as we heard repeatedly, and we've heard this afternoon, this discretion has scarcely been used. What the bill offers, therefore, is greater clarity and certainty for those who do take the difficult step to bring a civil case about what they can expect. As the committee concluded, simply providing further guidance to the courts on how discre discretion should be applied would not achieve this. Taking forward a civil action, of course, is not an easy option. The testimony we heard, both in public and in private sessions, underscored the imperative of ensuring that survivors have access to the widest possible support and advice, and I'm pleased the Minister recognises this in her uh, written response, although I think, as Claire Baker said, it would be helpful to have a bit more detail around the types of support um, that is likely to be available. Turning to some of the other issues considered by the committee, let me start with the issue of definitions. I very much welcome the decision to broaden out the scope of the bill to cover not simply those who suffered abuse in a care setting. Under human rights law, the vulnerability of the pursuer who was a child at the time of the abuse is the critical determining factor, not where the abuse took place. Helpful too is the fact that the definition of abuse it has been expanded to include not just physical and sexual, but also emotional abuse. But like uh, Mary Evans, I think the, the bill does need to go further still with explicit reference to neglect to bring it into line 
with international human rights uh, law standards. Clearly, the retrospective application of the legislation is fundamental to achieving its objectives. By and large, I think the right balance has been struck, including the difficult decision not to overturn the substantive law on prescription. Uh, but as I said to the Minister earlier, I do have some misgivings about permitting cases disposed of by decree of absolvator to be re-raised. I entirely accept and support we must ensure fair treatment for those who have tried to bring actions in the past but were time barred. In cases disposed of by a decree of dismissal, that seems relatively straightforward. However, by also opening up cases disposed of by decree of absolvator, I do worry that we may be setting a dangerous precedent, albeit with the best of intentions. The Minister should suggest in a written um, response, given the uniqueness of this category, it will not set a precedent for future categories of claims. The basis on which such an assertion can be made, to me, is difficult to understand. Finally, let me offer a few thoughts on the financial aspects of the bill, which did also raise concerns with those we took evidence from. Uh, in truth, as Rona Mackay, I think, rightly pointed out, no one can know for certain the number of cases that are likely to be brought, or indeed the nature and extent of the support survivors might require in pursuing uh, claims. Some, of course, will opt not to go down the legal route, but many will. And Police Scotland's evidence pointed to a number much higher than the 2,000 or so projected in the bill's financial memo. Meanwhile, we heard suggestions that one law firm already has a thousand clients on its books. Knowing as we do the pressure that our court service staff are already under, I feel we should not underestimate the potential risks here. Likewise, we hear evidence, as Jeremy Balfour uh, reminded us, about the risk that some organisations vital to providing support and care to vulnerable young people today could themselves be liable for large claims, in turn putting at risk the services they provide. None of this is easy, nor an argument against the approach laid out in the bill. However, in addressing the failures of the past, we must also guard against creating the conditions whereby they can be repeated in future. Let me uh, finally give the final word to one of the survivors we heard from. Mr Aitken said, it will have a dramatic effect, this bill, on the lives of the thousands of survivors in this country who have suffered the most terrible and horrific abuse. They are still suffering from that abuse to this day. As they grow older, every survivor loses resilience and resource and the effects of the trauma that they have suffered in childhood surface. In many cases, they end up in hospital, the criminal justice system or prison. Worst of all, there are friends of ours who have suffered so badly that they have taken their own lives. It may not be a panacea, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I look forward to Parliament agreeing the general principles of this bill this evening. Thank you. Can we have John Finney to be followed by Fulton McGregor? Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I say at the outset that the Scottish Green Party will be supporting the general principles of the bill at decision time tonight? And like others, um, as a member of the Justice Committee, I'd like to convey thanks to the, the, the many, many people, uh, both within and without Parliament, that's brought us to this point where we're at this particular discussion and particular reference to the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the action plan that they drafted. Um, it, a lot of people have touched on the points. I think they're worthy of uh, a repetition uh, about the importance of removal of the limitation period, the, the time bar, and generally that requires that civil actions must be raised within three years. And, and everyone has rightly said that the policy is about improving access to justice and addressing barriers. And I think it's fair to say that this is part of a package and that not all barriers to justice uh, are indeed legal or have a legal uh, remedy. Um, I, I think uh, there's often been discussion in this chamber about uh, the law changing for a single category, potentially having unintended consequences. And the Minister addressed that right at the outset by saying this is about a striking a balance. And I think the balance has been properly uh, struck here. It will have retrospective application um, uh, and uh, that will address, hopefully, the silencing effect, which hasn't been appreciated. Um, we know that the Scottish Government uh, considered the, the, the wider rights aspects and had to find a, ju a special justification for um, bringing this forward. Um, and, and certainly my view that the, the childhood sexual abuse has unique characteristics, and these have been touched on by, by other speakers, and that these characteristics justify a special limitation regime, the abhorrence of the acts, the vulnerability, the effect. And also reference has been made to some of the consequences, mental health issues and effect of, uh, the effect of incapacity, post-traumatic stress. But I think it's also important to say that all survivors are individuals and think people are affected in a different way. We did hear very powerful evidence um, um, about uh, the uh, insurmountable barrier that's faced at the moment. And we also did hear about 
Section 19A of the Prescription and Limitations Act 1973 and the discretion that is possible that, and that, again, others have talked on this, an action, um, and that would uh, retains a discretion to an action to proceed, quote, if it seems it's equitable to do so. But we've also heard from the statistics that it hasn't ever, bar one occasion, um, been the case that that's been uh, uh, um, a, a course that's been followed. And indeed, the onus is on the pursuer to show that justice requires action to be taken. Um, now, uh, there's also been suggestions that we've had that, and I stress small c, that the judiciary ha have been conservative in this aspect. I'd like to touch on the private evidence we heard, and I think people will understand that there's a large measure of uh, confidentiality that attaches itself to that, um, both for uh, respecting the, the, the individual privacy. But the experiences did inform us greatly, and um, um, particularly the, the views on the bill. Um, we heard from, a, a, I heard from the same gentleman as Stuart Stevenson did, and the gentleman was abused by individuals, but he was also abused by a public system, by various groups. He was passed around carelessly, and I would say callously, um, and indeed abandoned in, in a system. Um, and it was a humbling experience to, to, to listen, and I have great respect and gratitude for the individuals who came forward to speak to us, not least because many, indeed some uh, we know, will not necessarily benefit from this particular route. Um, and the, the issue is also, I'm always concerned uh, about human rights, and if rights are extinguished, I'm concerned about them. So we know that the Scottish Government states it gave serious consideration to whether anything could be done to revive the rights extinguished um, uh, in respect of abuse prior to 1964. And the committee has asked the, the gov government to look at what other options, oh, pardon me, excuse me, options there are for redress that should be made available to this group. But, and something else that's been touched on, of course, is the expectations that have been raised on the impact on our courts and tribunal services. It's something else that the, the committee reports picked up on. Uh, and the adverse, potential adverse impact on third sector support. Um, and the uh, government, again, has been asked by the committee for uh, input on that. I think we don't know uh, as, as, as regards to, to the numbers, and I think it's not necessarily uh, helpful to speculate. Um, we did also hear uh, of, um, indeed, that uh, due to the passage of time, that was the phrase, uh, and the poor quality and potentially missing evidence, it was argued this could lead to unfair trials. I roundly reject this uh, suggestion. It certainly is the case that witnesses may be dead and capacity to run traceable key documents might have been lost or destroyed. And, some of us will know from our constituency what the challenge of getting information. Um, and we also know that criminal offences are not subject to any limitation period. And the passage of time, that phrase, certainly hasn't stopped the excellent work that Police Scotland have done with support of the statute agencies, with support of third sector support groups and a dedicated unit within the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service to successfully prosecute historic cases. Each case, of course, in its individual merits, but it's important to point out that there's a higher degree of proof that applies in, in criminal cases beyond all reasonable doubt. Civil litigation is a lower less threshold balance of probabilities. In the short time I've left, I would, I would like to just uh, um, reiterate comments that uh, others have made about consideration of the term neglect. And that does relate to the consistency of terminology. So we've heard that um, both domestic, international and the human rights of the child and that this was a, a factor that applied to the definition of trials. I learned a phrase, decree absolvator. Um, 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 I didn't know about that before. This route isn't for everyone. I also learned the term legal certainty. And I think what we want to leave survivors with is that there's a certainty that their position has been recognised. And this may be an avenue of redress for some of them. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Justice Committee, I support this bill and agree with others that it will improve access to justice for survivors of historical childhood abuse. I'd like to thank the Minister and Government for bringing the bill forward and the Convener of the Justice Committee and all the members for agreeing to the general principles in such a consensual and sensitive way. In committee, we dealt with many of the technicalities, as others have mentioned, of, of the bill and scrutinised it fully. We heard evidence from a number of people and others have said the most powerful from those survivors and I can't thank them highly enough for coming uh, to committee and doing that. Although there are undoubtedly some shortfalls, for me though as a social worker and a socialist, this bill represents our continuing progression as a nation. It represents as a country we treat this issue with the utmost seriousness. We acknowledge that we got things wrong for victims in the past and that we are on the right path to truly tackle this issue. It's absolutely right that this bill, that the time bill should be removed for these types of horrible offences. 
Just earlier this week, the Chamber engaged in a debate on the rape clause, and many who spoke, including Kezia Dugdale, when she read out that letter, about the spoke about the difficulties people have in coming forward, often staying silent for many, many years. Such is the case with these sort of offences. Indeed, in my experience in social work, and through speaking to people from the fabulous charity, the Moira Anderson Foundation, many people do not speak out about childhood abuse until they themselves are parents. It is not uncommon, as another speaker has said, for social workers, health professionals and others to often have a parent or a family disclose for the first time after many years when the reason for actual engagement with that family may be something totally different altogether. Also, as John Lamont raised, just last night I was with other members in the chamber viewing the film Hidden in Silence, a very powerful film documenting the trauma of two women from an ethnic minority background who were sexually abused in their childhood, one choosing to speak out to authorities and the other not, but both coming back to the issue after many years and demonstrating through the contrasting approaches the difficulties that they faced in doing so. I'd like to thank Margaret Mitchell, the convener of the cross-party group, for arranging the screening, and I would take this opportunity to encourage all members to view it when they get the chance. I do believe this bill takes the correct steps that are needed to ensure access to justice is available to survivors of historical abuse. It is vital that we continue to explore measures in which survivors of historical abuse have, been, uh, have the support and means to deal with the effects felt from that childhood abuse. At present, individuals are not able to bring cases to civil court for personal injuries after three years, including for side effects like PTSD, anxiety or depression. <laughs> Survivors currently face barriers in attempting to access the civil justice system and bring civil action against their abusers. Whilst it is impossible to ever remove the damage and hurt caused by abuse, and I think everybody has recognised that, removing this time limit means that those who suffered historical abuse while, while in care and, and out with can now have access to a means of further justice and may take some degree of comfort from this and be able to have their voices heard. This bill isn't designed to be a solution for all survivors, and we heard that quite clearly through the committee, and we must ensure that support is always available in varying forums. Fit civil action won't be for everyone, but I believe it should be still an option, and we should have measures in place to ensure this is accessible to those who choose this route. I am glad that this bill is also encompassing, regardless of where the abuse took place. This may include those affected in football, for example, as mentioned by John Lamont. And just yesterday, the local media in my area reported in a fairly high-profile case of an individual originally from my constituency who has now been convicted of sexual abusing several different victims over 40 years ago. Previously, this case had failed to result in prosecution in the 1970s due to a lack of evidence. He has now been found guilty of four serious sexual offences. These individuals now have more options open to them, if they so wish. So, presiding officer, does the bill go far enough? Maybe not, but it's a start and puts us ahead of many other countries on this issue. Should there be any reason for the bill not to pass? Of course not. The purpose of the legislation is to bring justice to some of those who were abused and give them a voice. I do believe that we should make um, further provisions for those who were affected pre-1964. But as I said at the start, it's even more than that. It's a statement from a bold and progressive government. It's part of a journey that I'm confident there will be further developments as we move forward. So I'm delighted that the committee has agreed to the principles and I urge us all in the chamber to agree with the Minister's motion in passing the bill. Thanks. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And for the avoidance of doubt, I would refer members to my registered interest as a practising member of the Faculty of Advocates. Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the Scottish Government seeking to address the unfortunate and continuing issue of childhood abuse, past, present and future. As the policy memorandum that accompanies the bill makes clear, and has already been referred to in debate, one of the reasons for pursuing this legislation is that the social taboo, which is long attached to childhood abuse, has added to the reluctance of survivors to come forward. It is important that the law and the legal system should be a facilitator and not a barrier to justice for survivors. As evidence before the Justice Committee has indicated and as is set out in its report, the limitation period can pose a particular difficulty for victims of childhood abuse. 
The discretion set out in section 19A of the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973 is not often exercised, and it is against that background that the new provisions for the 1973 Act are proposed, and the Committee's support for clarification and improvement of that law is to be welcomed. At the same time, the Committee has rightly raised a number of matters which require further consideration and attention. Although these might be thought at first sight simply to be matters of mere detail, on closer examination, they merit closer scrutiny. Uh, as someone who is not a member of the Justice Committee, may I commend the Committee on its thorough and thoughtful approach to this matter and the fairly comprehensive report it has prepared. I say comprehensive, knowing as a lawyer that inevitably something will not have been covered. But may I say that certainly every issue which arose to my mind has been covered. However, I would encourage the government to respond in detail to the points raised within the report for further consideration. Some of these have already been referred to here today, and um, I will seek to focus on one aspect in particular. That issue is the potential costs that may arise and appear to be wholly uncertain according to the Justice Report. And these take on a number of aspects. The government has sought to estimate the number of survivors that may seek to raise a civil action. However, the report details a number of factors which could see this number rise significantly. An example is the role played by claims management companies or personal injury lawyers. A larger number of claimants than anticipated could see court costs rise, especially for complex cases. It is essential that this possibility is taken into account at this stage in order that any required changes are made so that the bill is effective in ensuring justice in a timely manner. Resources are key to this, as is a more accurate picture of the number of cases likely to be brought. My colleague Jeremy Balfour raised the issue of successor organizations in the third sector. And I would add to that, voluntary organizations that provide essential support services in society today may find themselves having to shoulder responsibility, financial and otherwise, for unauthorized and unacceptable actions of individuals who worked for or with those organizations sometimes decades previously. Such an organization may not have had insurance at the time or an insurance policy which does not indemnify them against the claim or one whose insurance provider no longer exists. It could face dissolution in order to meet the claim. In such circumstances, and I pose the question, how can we ensure that essential work done by the third sector is not lost as a result of unintended consequences? And what have local authorities, this has been raised already today, how will all of this further impact their ability to deliver services? They are likely to face similar issues. Uh, this was raised before the Justice Committee by COSLA in that um, a number of concerns raised in the Justice Report relate to a higher percentage of claims being potentially possible against local authorities as a result of the majority of children's services being delivered by them. There is no estimate available at present as to the cost these local authorities could face. The main insurance provider for local authorities between 1975 and 1992 ceased operations in the 90s. And insurance premiums covering such matters now could rise significantly as a result of this legislation. Now, I emphasize that these are not reasons against the bill and its purposes, but rather to emphasize that we need to ensure that the bill will not have unintended consequences which are desired by no one. Assistance clearly must be given to all survivors so that they can assess for themselves which solution they want to follow, whether through a court process or by other means. And the bill has support across the chamber. I look forward to a detailed response from the government to the areas of concern identified by the Justice Committee and particularly in rela relation to resolution of potential unintended consequences and undesired consequences of the bill which I have briefly sketched. 
The last of the open speakers is Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like Gordon Lindhurst, I would also like to refer members to my voluntary uh, register of interest as a non-practising member of the Law Society of Scotland. I'd like to, first of all, commend the Government for bringing this important bill forward. And also, like others, to commend fellow members of the Justice Committee and the stewardship of Margaret Mitchell through reviewing the, the bill through the committee process. I think the way that the committee worked collaboratively and constructively on this piece of legislation demonstrated the strength of the committee system in the Scottish Parliament when members and parties worked together on matters of importance. Like others as well, I would also like to, to thank all the witnesses from organisations who, who came and gave evidence, in particular to the survivors who gave evidence in private. The experience of taking evidence from the survivors was incredibly moving and upsetting for all of us. And what struck me, as well as the, the powerful evidence that they gave us around their determination to, to seek justice and the, the harrowing experiences that, they, that they'd gone through and, and, and explaining those to us. There was also a sense amongst the survivors that, that I spoke to that this bill already started to give a, an important recognition to their suffering. And I think while we should absolutely focus on the, the technicalities and the, the practicalities of the bill, we should also recognise that point that there's already a process of justice that's begun by the fact that it's being discussed here in the Scottish Parliament. I, like all other members of the committee, welcome mm. the aims of the bill to improve access to justice for survivors of this horrific historical abuse and, like others, endorse the general principles of the bill. By removing the three-year time limit in which victims of childhood abuse can bring a civil action against the abuser, we are creating an important choice, not a panacea, but an important choice for survivors. Because the, the, the system that's in, in place at the moment, as Kim Leslie from the Law Society made clear, does not square. It does not square that there is no such time limit for a criminal prosecution. But the situation is that uh, an, an, an individual cannot prosecute after a lengthy passage of time when it, when it comes to a civil matter. And this bill will rightly address that injustice. There are two points that I'd like to pick up on in particular. One is cases where abuse occurred before 1964 and the other is around the definition of, of, of emotional abuse. The serious consideration was given by the government to the matter of prescription and cases before 1964. And I, I'm glad that that, that that was the case. In all the oral evidence that we took in the committee, it was clear that the, the government, in, in, the, in the view of the, the witnesses, had, had struck the right balance. The, the Faculty of Advocates commented that a potential challenge could be made against the bill if uh, the prescription was part of, uh, the prescription was sought to be extinguished. However, like others, Margaret Mitchell and, and, and Mary Evans, I would also uh, urge the Minister to, to, to address what other redress measures can be made available. To, uh, to those who were abused in cases that occurred before 1964. And in terms of uh, emotional abuse, much of the, the, the points have already been covered by other speakers. I, I support the inclusive and non-exhaustive definition of abuse. However, in, in oral evidence, Laura Dunlop QC, representing the Faculty of Advocates, suggested that it, it, it should be open to the courts to develop the concept of emotional abuse um, uh, abuse generally, but particularly emotional abuse. And I wondered if the, the government could comment whether any guidance uh, would be useful with regard to uh, that specific definition of emotional abuse, particularly considering that the committee ha has, ha has concluded that uh, asking the Scottish government to respond to uh, uncertainties around that term, particularly with regard to uh, spiritual and psychological abuse were, were two matters that were, were raised. I support what other members have said about neglect in the interests of time. I will, will not ex expand on, on that just now. As others have said, it, it was emphasised to the committee that, that this bill is not a, a panacea, and, and I share that point. 
However, I would like to finish by quoting Harry Aitken from the, who gave us evidence in one of our, our first sessions representing the former boys and girls abused in, in quarriers' homes. And he said, the significance of the bill is that at long last, survivors will have the choice. That element of choice has been denied to them until now. They will already have heard that it will be a difficult task for them to go to court. They will have heard a robust, that it, they will have to have a robust case that, and that case will be cross-examined and it will have to stand up to the normal practices of the legal system. However, having made that choice and found the courage to go forward, I believe that that will fortify them. We should support and pass this bill to help fortify survivors. And as Mary Evans powerfully said, to do that so on their journey of recovery in the interests of justice and to seek the closure that they so rightly desire. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Mary Fee, around six minutes please, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And in closing for Scottish Labour and as our member on the Justice Committee, um, I would like to thank all of the individuals and organisations who assisted the committee in producing this Stage 1 report for the Limitations Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. And I would also like to praise the outstanding bravery of the survivors of childhood abuse who gave the committee a very powerful insight as to why this bill is needed. And I'd like to commend everyone in the chamber today who has taken part in this debate for maintaining a, a respectful and calm atmosphere as we discuss what are highly sensitive and emotive issues. And contributions from members across the chamber today indicate that this legislation is rightly a priority that all of us share. The Limitations Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill will enable many survivors of childhood abuse to make the choices they need to seek appropriate reparations for the abuse they have suffered. And the reasons for bringing in this bill are sound and I support the government in their aims. And the Justice Committee report supports the general principles of the bill and like the committee, I have a few reservations about some of the small technical details of the bill. The recommendations of the report are well researched and well thought out. And I will touch upon some of these in order to raise with the government how we can work together to find the right outcomes for survivors of childhood abuse. The current three year limitation period is, as we have heard, a barrier to seeking justice and one that will be overcome with this bill. This was agreed by the committee and the majority of those who prevented presented evidence to the committee and by removing the current time bar survivors will be able to take appropriate means to take their civil rights to court and bring action against offenders and this may not be the right option for all survivors as we have heard in evidence sessions and we have heard expressed in the chamber today however very importantly it will give survivors further choices and during one of our evidence sessions, Laura Dunlop QC pointed out that the process of bringing an action could in some cases do more harm than good because of the significant emotional impact of speaking about their abuse and reliving the trauma. And that's why I believe we must ensure support is available for survivors to make the right decision. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission have also highlighted that there would remain a necessary or significant evidential burden for survivors in raising this through the court and identifying their offender. And in supporting the survivors, we help them make the right individual choice. And as the committee report states, this could help to manage survivors' expectations about what can be achieved. And the minister has advised the committee that steps would be taken to ensure support is available. And as others have raised in the chamber today, I look to the minister for further detail of that support. And on the definition of abuse in the setting, the committee rightly welcomed the decision to allow action against abuse, regardless of the setting. And it would have been a further injustice to survivors by creating a two-tier system to prevent them from seeking redress 
if they had been abused in one protected place where others were open to action. And as we have heard on cases where the abuse started before 1964, Scottish Labour are happy to work with the government and those across the chamber to find some form of restitution. And during the evidence sessions, we heard evidence proposing other options. However, we would like to see a model that fits Scotland's needs, but far more importantly, it fits survivors' needs. And the Scottish Government must work with survivors and listen to their needs and find the most suitable solution for them. And I recognise that there were mixed views on the inclusion of neglect within the definition of abuse. However, the inclusion of neglect would mean consistency with other domestic and international laws and would be a deterrent to such behaviour, as argued by Detective Chief Superintendent Leslie Bohm. And I support the inclusion of neglect and I welcome the commitment from the Minister to look further into, into this issue. And on the financial implications highlighted by COSLA and third sector organisations, there are serious concerns that the backroom costs would impact the resources of current services. And while we wholly support the government's aim of widen, widening access to justice for survivors, we do need more information on how the government will deal with these financial implications going forward. And I welcome the Minister's response to the report where she acknowledges that there is great uncertainty for local authorities, charities and third sector groups. And we look to the Scottish Government for information on how they plan to support these organisations going forward. And finally, Presiding Officer, we welcome this bill and praise the courage of the survivors, some in the gallery today, for their input into the Justice Committee's report and their campaigning to end the current time bar, bar which has denied access to justice for too long and confirm our support for the aims and provisions of the Limitations Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. Thank you. And I call Annie Wells. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to all the speakers today. And I would also like to pay a special thanks to those who gave evidence at the Justice Committee, especially the survivors who spoke on such sensitive and personal issues. And I would like to also start off by reaffirming my own support and my party support for this bill. Widening access for justice for survivors of historical childhood abuse is the right thing to do. By the very nature of this crime, it is absolutely right to expect that it can take survivors many, many years to come to terms with what, has, what they have been through and to seek the justice that they deserve. Of course, the current law does provide judges with discretion to allow a case out with three-year limitation period to proceed. But as my colleague Margaret Mitchell, the convener of the Justice Committee and many others have stated, the discretion, discretion has virtually never been used. We all understand the practical rationale behind the three-year three time limitation on civil court claims. The longer the delay, the less concrete the evidence. The wider the window for potential legal cases the more difficult it becomes for organisations to have the certainty and finality needed for day-to-day -day business, as well as the security of knowing there are no pending legal claims. These are the reasons why similar time bar periods for personal injury claims exist in nearly all similar developed legal systems in the world. However, despite these practical concerns, we are in unanimous agreement today that the time limitation for survivors of historical sexual abuse whether this be sexual, physical or emotional, should be lifted so that survivors get the justice they deserve. Underpinning this bill is a unanimous recognition of the unique experiences survivors of childhood sexual abuse face. Victim Support Scotland supports this idea, highlighting the length of time it may take for someone to realise they, they have been abused because of the silencing tactics used by abusers the feelings of shame, embarrassment and trauma that may prevent someone from coming forward for many years. NSPCC Scotland, in carrying out a piece of research with 60 adults, found that it took on average an on average of eight years to tell someone about it. Therefore, not only am I pleased to see the lifting of the three-year time limitation, but also that the law will be applied retrospectively meaning the bill applies to the abuse occurred before, as far back as 1964. In line with what, 
in line with what had already been raised in the Chamber today, as well as previously to the Justice Committee, there are, of course, considerations to be made as we look beyond our agreement on the Bill's general principles. While it's undoubtedly the right and moral thing to do, the Committee highlighted the, what it saw as a Conservative estimate by the Government with regards to the number of uh, survivors that could potentially come forward. And my colleague Gordon Lindhurst touched on some of this in more detail, citing the difficulty in predicting such numbers and therefore cost implications also. Local authorities and third sector organisations will be affected, as we saw when Cosley came before the Justice Committee. Although they very much support the bill, concerns were raised about the financial implications of this on local authorities and how such costs would be met with current identified insurance policies. Furthermore, there are also practical considerations to be made for such bodies when it comes to giving evidence. How will such organisations answer questions on behalf of a defender, perhaps an ex-employee who has either passed away or long since left? Douglas Ross also spoke on the broader impact that this will have on the court in terms of resource. What is the capacity of the courts in terms of taking on a number of new cases, an estimate for which we don't have, and how do we ensure that survivors are not deterred from pursuing cases because of lengthy and potentially avoidable delays? I'd also like to touch on the more human aspects of this bill, as my colleague Jeremy Balfour touched upon. Pursuing a civil action will not always be the right solution for all survivors, and at times the court process could be could do more harm than good, a point raised by many across this chamber. And Jeremy also said that we need to look at the vulnerability of survivors and some of the long-standing effects that go hand in hand, such as alcohol misuse and drugs misuse. We need to make sure there's support there for the survivors. And furthermore, what potential action could be taken by the Scottish Government to ensure justice for those cases which occurred prior to 1964? In terms of service provision, as Margaret Mitchell highlighted, given the overall financial and resource implications of the bill, we need to ensure current support services for survivor, survivors are not adversely affected. And as mentioned by others in the Chamber today, last night the CPG for Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse screened an extremely insightful documentary on the experiences of child, victims of childhood abuse from the BME community. In it, and it is this case, cases such as this, where vast socio-cultural barriers already face survivors in coming forward, that we would seek to reaffirm support for existing services. Finally, in closing for the Scottish Conservatives today, I would like to again reaffirm my party support for this bill. In rightfully acknowledging the unique case of childhood abuse um, victims, the three-year time limitation in place for civil claims should, of course, be lifted. Concerns over its implementation do, of course, exist. And as long as we are realistic about what these are and what measures should be put in place early on, they will be manageable. I hope for further scrutiny in the later debates, but I do very much welcome the bill at the first stage. Thank you. I now call Annabel Ewing to close the debate on behalf of the government. Can you take us to just before decision time, please, Minister? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This, I think, has been a, a valuable and an important debate, and I would like to thank members for their contributions today. Mary Fee was absolutely right that the tenor of the debate has been absolutely excellent and fitting, uh, indeed, in terms of the subject that we are all currently addressing. I, I am uh, pleased that members share the aim of widening access to justice for survivors of childhood abuse and, and I would say that Ben McPherson was absolutely right to say that we should ensure that this key objective of, of, of ensuring justice for this group of people who have been through so much should not become obscured when we have discussions on the more technical provisions of the bill, as important as those discussions are. I, I'm also pleased to note, presiding officer, that there is support for the general principles of the bill across uh, the chamber. I have, I can assure members, also listened carefully to a number of points uh, that were raised and I will, uh, of course, give them full uh, consideration. Uh, I would now like to touch on some of the issues referred to and if I don't get uh, time to, to address all of them, please do not hesitate to uh, corner me and, and seek further uh, clarification. I am grateful uh, to, to Mary Fee and Claire Baker and other, others for raising the issue of support for survivors. I absolutely do agree that it is important to ensure 
that survivors are given the right support in making decisions, whether it is a decision about whether or not uh, to raise a civil action or a decision about what, what uh, sort of support is best for them. I would point out to the Chamber that since 2007, over £10 million has been distributed through the Survivor Support Innovation and Development Fund to third and voluntary sector organisations. The fund has a budget of £1.8 million for this financial year. With regard to in-care survivors in May 2015, we also announced investment of £13.5 million over five years to expand and enhance support for survivors of in-care childhood abuse through a dedicated support fund relaunched this year as the Future Pathways Fund. Decisions regarding civil actions are, uh, as we have heard, complex, a point uh, well made by Rona Mackay, and anyone uh, faced with such a decision needs quality, impartial advice and guidance. I would say to, to members that we are currently in active discussions with the Law Society of Scotland on how we can best raise awareness among solicitors about the very particular issues involved in these cases and how they can become better equipped to support survivors. We are also currently planning an event in conjunction with the Law Society which will bring together the legal profession uh, and professionals in survivor support organisations to ensure that there is mutual understanding and a sharing of knowledge. We, of course, remain committed <coughs> to exploring what other forms of support uh, can be made available. Uh, with regard to the issue of the definition of abuse, uh, I am grateful in particular to, to Mary Evans and Liam McCarthy, who I note has had to leave us for his flight to Orkney, and to, to John Finney uh, and others who raised the, the issue about the definition of abuse in the bill. I think it is important to keep in mind when looking at how abuse has been defined elsewhere that each definition is designed for its own purpose. Uh, what works best in one context may not be uh, the best approach in another. As I mentioned in my opening statement, it is important that the definition sends the right signal while, uh, as much as possible, avoiding unintended consequences. I have listened carefully to the evidence presented to the committee and to the arguments put forward here today. And as I said in my opening remarks, I will carefully reflect, reflect on these. I would now like to turn uh, to the uh, issue of the estimation of numbers and I do note concerns about the impact of the bill and estimations we have carried out in relation to the number of survivors likely to come forward. As members will have seen, we estimate that between 400 and 4,000 survivors may come forward with the midpoint of 2,200 being considered most likely. I absolutely recognise that this is not an exact science. We simply do not know, and that is the, the actual position. We have used a variety of methods and looked at a range of sources, but it is, of course, possible that more actions will be raised or fewer actions could be raised. It is clear that at this stage, we do not know if these estimates will be right or wrong. All witnesses in the Justice Committee sessions have recognised that this is very difficult to predict, to predict. Nothing in the evidence indicates that there is a better estimate that should be used Instead, a point uh, well made by uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, and it may uh, interest the uh, members to note that further to a Law Society uh, briefing for this very debate, the Law Society did state that they believe that the likely impact of the bill has been adequately captured in the financial memorandum. Uh, I think uh, reference was made to Police Scotland data. Uh, and of course, it is helpful to hear about ongoing work from Police Scotland amongst others. But it is also important to keep in mind that the number of victims identified within police files is not the same uh, as the number of survivors who will come forward to raise an action. In deciding whether to go ahead with an action, factors that will need to be considered include whether there's a solvent defender, whether there's sufficient evidence to prove the case, and whether the survivor, <laughs> perhaps key above all, is prepared to go through the often challenging court process. Not all cases identified by the police will translate into civil actions. Witnesses giving evidence to the committee recognise the difficult task of estimating numbers and the great uncertainties involved. In terms of the potential impact for financial and resource implications for local authorities, third sector organisations and their insurers, a point made by several members this afternoon, I do absolutely recognise that the costs that arise may go beyond the costs directly associated with defending any actions that are raised. But as we have set out in the financial memorandum, it is not possible to estimate what this impact will be at this point in time. The Bill's general principles are supported by COSLA and by many third sector organisations. I will continue uh, my engagement with COSLA. In fact, I would uh, mention to the Chamber that I recently met with Councillor Stephanie Primrose, spokesperson for education, children and young people in COSLA. 
we did agree at, at that meeting that the best way forward is to continue our dialogue. We should not rush ahead and draw conclusions before the facts of the matter are known, and we will carefully consider evidence of the impact of the bill. With regard to the issue of the impact on uh, courts, uh, what I would say is that, uh, further to a point I think made by Annie Wells, that no estimate had been made, I would refer Annie Wells, in case she's not had time to read the financial memorandum, that we do actually provide a figure in terms of a gross estimate for the costs here, that is £288,000. Uh, uh, excuse me, Minister. Uh, could I ask members to please have a bit of courtesy and be quiet? This is an important discussion that's going on with the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, and so uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that, again, of those that actions, not all people will pursue an action. That is absolutely a decision for the survivor themselves. If they do decide that that is the route that they decide they want to go down, I think it's important to bear in mind that not all of those actions uh, that get raised in court, not all will be raised at exactly the same time, not all will be of exactly the same length. Uh, and, uh, of course, it is important to remember that many actions do settle out of course, court. I will, of course, and the government will, of course, continue to have uh, discussions with the Scottish Courts uh, and Tribunal Service, and the situation will be reviewed uh, on an ongoing uh, basis. Uh, I think also reference was made to the fact that there might be a significant number of cases with one particular law firm. I think that example was raised in committee uh, as well. Um, but, of course, uh, it... Excuse again, me again, Minister. Can I please ask members to be courteous and be quiet? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, so the, the reference was made to, I think, a, a law firm having a thousand potential cases on its, on its books. But, of course... I think it's again important to, to recognise that maybe not all of these cases will be re-raised uh, and again it goes back to the choice of the survivor and we should not seek in any way to, to usurp that choice. That is entirely uh, a matter for each uh, survivor uh, to determine for themselves. While we cannot predict therefore exactly how many will be re-raised, uh, it, it is uh, likely to be the case that not all of these cases will uh, end up back uh, or in uh, the courts. Uh, also, I, I would wish to uh, just clarify again the issue of the Section uh, 17 uh, D uh, uh, matter in terms of the uh, position of that in the bill and also the other uh, section in that regard, the Section 17 C uh, provision. And in regard to Section 17 C, I, I, I would again come back to the issue of the decree of absolvator, which some members have raised, and I think they'll be surprised to find that they're becoming, I think as John Finney alluded to, sort of legal experts uh, in terms of our civil uh, uh, procedures. But I think it's important uh, to recall that um, whether or not Absolvator was the most appropriate disposal for these actions would have been in fact a matter for the, t the parties uh, who agreed the settlement at the time. Uh, and, but the, the fundamental point is that these cases did not uh, uh, receive an adjudication on uh, the merits. And just for the sake of completeness, I think it should be noted that the decree of absolvator uh, in terms of current Scots law is not an absolute in any event. There is actually the possibility of new uh, evidence uh, being brought forward uh, under the res novator uh, procedure, albeit that that is uh, extremely rare. I think uh, some members, Jean Lamont, also referred to wider uh, issues in terms of uh, survivors and of course, uh, raising a civil action, as we have heard, is not the solution uh, for all survivors. And there are a number of uh, strands of activity uh, currently underway, including uh, the uh, work that is going on uh, in, uh, with Celsius engaged with directly uh, with the survivors in terms of framing the further engagement and consultation on uh, financial redress. And that, of course, will look at the position of those in-care survivors pre-September 1964. This process, as I say, is being led by Celsius and the Interaction Action Plan Review Group, and it will fully explore the issues around redress and gather a wider uh, range uh, of views. Uh, I'm not sure of my time, President Officer, but I think I should probably start concluding. Um, I would like to thank once again uh, all the members who have contributed to today's uh, debate. It has been a very engaging and meaningful debate which has raised a number of important issues. I am pleased to reiterate again the fact that there is support across the chamber for the principles 
uh, of the bill. And I think that is a very uh, important signal uh, to send, that this Parliament can send to the survivors who have been through uh, so much and whom uh, we have paid tribute to this afternoon for their bravery and their determination to ensure that their voices were listened to and acknowledged and that they can now get the justice that they have been seeking. So in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, I would just like to say that this, I think, has been a very uh, important and useful debate. I will carefully reflect on the issues that members have raised uh, and I look forward to further progressing the bill. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, thank you. And that concludes our debate on stage one of the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of motion 3812 in the name of Derek Mackay on the financial resolution for the Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill. I call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Thank you very much. There are two questions to be put today. The first question is that motion 5290 in the name of Annabel Ewing on Limitation Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill at Stage 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the final question is that Motion 3812 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Financial Resolution for the Limitation Childhood, Childhood Abuse Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>